Let's see. All right. So welcome, everyone, uh, to this webinar I called uh, Debunking the Myths on Type of Headaches and Diagnosis. And um, well, I uh, added a, a title, What Kind of Migraine Are You Dealing With? Um, and I put this image, I, I love to share images uh, and to find images for my presentations because I find that images often speak a bit more than words. Um, and this this photo here, this lady, we can assume maybe, uh, is is made of a multitude of little tiny pictures. And uh, only by looking at the full picture with a bit of distance can we actually make up of what's going on and, and uh, uh, imagine or see her face. So you'll understand that, uh, that a bit uh, more when I go ahead. When I present for medical conferences or uh, uh, different uh, committees and boards, I always present my disclosures. This means that I have received uh, honoraria and payments from companies, pharmaceutical companies, where I serve uh, either as a board member, speaker, or consultant. Um, and all of those might uh, are actually related to the new therapies, uh, antibodies, GPANs, Botox, et cetera. Uh, I also have the pleasure, of course, of chairing Migraine Canada, and I really encourage you to uh, look up our campaign. If you wonder, I will be boxing uh, for Migraine. I do boxing training for five, year, five years now. So uh, I have created my little page. It's very easy if you want to create your personal event, so go ahead. Um, all right, so let's uh, get uh, started. So tonight, we will discuss definitions. So first, some definitions in the world of headache are clear others are less clear. That means that sometimes even doctors, even experts, even the leaders of the international classification argue with one another. Okay, so I'll give you an example. A lot of people argue about the definition of vestibular migraine, which is something I live with and something that I uh, uh, have interest in. So quite frankly, just be clear. Sometimes there are things that are certain and there are things that are uncertain, and we have to live with that, some degree of uncertainty. And it's difficult, especially when, some, when you live with a, a disease or with symptoms that are extremely disabling, and we want to find a solution. So it all starts, in theory, with a proper diagnosis. But sometimes, it's not that easy. So tonight, I will not cover all the diagnosis. I will cover episodic and chronic migraines, some discussion, refractory migraine, also post-traumatic headache and migraine, uh, the aura. So uh, let's, uh, let's uh, start this. Just as an intro, okay, I like to start from very basic concepts before we dig into the details so we don't get lost. Um, how medicine has studied disease for centuries is that we observe symptoms, usually problems, um, in a person, and we, we then we find people who look alike, look alike, who have the same set of symptoms, and then we study them. Uh, and we have more and more techniques now to study uh, the human being. So MRI, CT scans, lab tests, genetic panels, electrophysiology, EEG, EMG. So then tons of labs. But remember, at the beginning of medicine, it was not that easy. Uh, so now we have more tests. So for example. People who live with a, a thyroid issue, well, they will have a set of symptoms, not necessarily all of them, some of them. And then, the, then eventually medicine found an understanding of the thyroid. We found a test to test the TSH. And we know if the TSH is too high or too low, there's a problem. And then we can treat with a levothyroxine, very common drug called Syntroid, so it's easy. And then uh, we can monitor the TSH level to say, is it too high, is it too low? And then we adjust the treatment. So that's an example of a, a relatively easy situation. So what we want is, okay, we, we want to understand the cause of the disease. So we say, fine, there is a lack of the thyroid hormone, the gland does not work. So this causes the symptoms of hypothyroidism. And then we give a treatment to correct that A to B easy. Now, no offense to the thyroid, but the brain is way more complicated. So in the brain, it gets really mixed up. And so by that, I mean that the brain has numerous system, networks, neurotransmitters. It works with chemistry, with electricity. It, had, it has different zones. 
So it's not easy to, to kind of understand those networks. And plus, we still don't have a lot of ways to dig into the brain in the electricity and the chemistry of it. So we can see some of the brain, of course, but not all of it. So when someone has a headache, uh, what can be the head, the neck, the sinuses, the TMJ, all of this is a bit together. Well, the question is, where does it come from? And usually it will come with either from something like a sinus or an eye or you know, a structure of the head, or if it comes from inside the, the, the skull, it will come from meninges and blood vessels. The brain itself, it doesn't feel a thing, okay? There's no pain fibers, there's no pain nerves in the brain. What makes pain inside the skull is the meninges. The meninges is like the big protection, the membrane that protects the, the brain. So if you think about meningitis and blood vessels, arteries and veins, those are super, super sensitive with lots of little nerves that can cause pain. So any headache will come somehow from an irritation or stimulation of pain fibers. And, and this I explained to medical students, to doctor, this is something very important. So whatever arrives that causes pain will come from somewhere, something wrong with this sensory system. In the classification, so how doctors put things together, we love to put classification. So we know what we're talking about, always in the spirit of research, right? So we, we, we do criteria, we make definitions. So all around the world, we all talk about the same thing. This is important because when we do research, well, we want to be talking about the same thing so we can talk together, right? So if someone in Asia and some, someone in North America don't have the same terms, then we'll all mix up and it's not good for research. So the classification has something around 215 diagnoses. Okay, so it's a lot of them. Um, but roughly, if we think about it, we separate the headaches in headaches that, are, that come from the problem from the sensory nerves themselves and headaches that come from something wrong with the brain or the skull or the arteries. So those are the usual causes. So problem with the blood vessels, infections, accidents, um, a, a medication, uh, something wrong with anything else in the body, something that is wrong with the nerves themselves. So those we call secondary headaches, headaches that are caused by something else. The primary headaches are headaches that are just part caused by a problem in the sensory system itself. It is not that, uh, that easy to understand this definition. And to be honest, there's, it's not perfect, but just it's very important and, uh, when we talk about diagnosis that when we teach doctors, like family doctors, neurologists, we start there. We say there's primary headaches, there's secondary headaches, and they're all in the classification. For those of you who are curious and, and who uh, may feel comfortable going into medical resources, you can access ICHD3 online, ICHD3.org, and you will see all the criteria that we, the doctors and other healthcare providers use to diagnose headaches. Okay, They're all there, and sometimes there are interesting notes as well about the different diseases. So the key here is that to do a diagnosis, well, unfortunately, up to this day, there is no test that can diagnose migraine with any certainty. Okay, So uh, if you have a brain tumor, okay, it's like having the computer on the left that's completely broken. Nobody would think that this computer works. It's, it is dead. Uh, and so on the MRI, we see this big, you don't need a medical degree to see that something is wrong with this brain. There's a big mass, a big ball into it. If you go below, well, you look at this computer, it's nice, it looks pretty good. But then when you start to open it, it crashes, the programs don't work. So it looks okay, but the, the system of it don't work. And that's what we see with migraines, a problem of systems and networks. So, so the thing is our society and humans love to work with their eyes. We like to see. So that's why we rely so much on the imaging and that's why so many of you, I'm sure, have had numerous CT scans and MRIs and other tests to try to understand what your diagnosis is, because we like visual proof. So humans are more and more like this little guy here. You know, nobody, uh, big eyes, big brain, you can remove the cigarette, ideally, and looking at a big screen for hours at a time and just trying to see and see and see. 
But the diagnosis of headache depends on a good history and listening to the symptoms. So we need to listen to what the person is saying and try to uh, understand of which animal we're talking about here, which category. Because migraine is way more than just a headache. I don't need to tell you this. I mean, if, if you live with any headache disorder, you know it's not uh, only headache, but migraine is more than a headache. There's I've put in blue, the light blue boxes are the symptoms that are part of the diagnostic criteria. So if you speak to a doctor and you want to uh, clarify what's going on with you, well, they will ask, are you sensitive to light or sound? Um, do you have nausea and vomiting? So this is those are all things that, that, that help us to diagnose migraine because migraine has been defined this way, all right? So we are still a bit in a, a circle here. We define migraine away, but since we don't have tests to diagnose it, we kind of know there are other symptoms, but those symptoms are the one we use to diagnose. And I will not go into big detail about this tonight. So one thing it's, that's important is that we know that migraine has very numerous causes or mechanisms. I prefer mechanism because a cause is like there's one reason like A to B. Here, we are not A to B. We are in networks and chemical and electrical networks. And all of these are determined by genes. So what we think is that migraine actually uh, is in, has different pieces and I will not go in depth about this. I gave another webinar, which is called The Science of Migraine, where I, I go into great detail, but it's all about chemistry and electricity. And there are numerous uh, substances and networks involved in the migraine's brain. The inflammation of the migraine attack is around the meninges and arteries. So we, we know where the pain comes from. And also this, I, uh, I elaborate more in my other webinar, but I just wanted to tell you very importantly, it's not true we don't know what causes migraine. It's just there's many parts to this. And just for fun, okay, this is this is part of the, <laughs> I don't expect to present this and I, I don't want to do, go into detail. I just want to show you how much we know about those things. And and in the, uh, the medical circles, um, now there's tons, you see all those zones, all, this is a brain, so we see all those zones, all those areas, all those networks. If you want even worse than that, let me show you. That's even worse, okay? So this is all lingo of medical uh, stuff that explains what happens during a migraine attack. I'm not going to talk about this, but I'm just showing you to show you how there's probably very many different types of migraine, different genes, different uh, equations. And that's why migraine is so complicated to diagnose and to put into categories. Okay. So now we switch to the Pokemons. I don't know if you remember the Pokemons, but I've always been amazed to see how many Pokemons there are. And they are all, you know, we, we describe them by their shape, their color, their capacities. And um, I remember little kids at the time, they were looking in a book with all the categories of Pokemon. It's a bit like the international headache classification. So uh, we, we are, we like classifications. So here's something I took for, uh, I took from the web. And I love this page. It's completely, completely inaccurate. From a scientific perspective, Dr. Smith is an ENT. This is his website, kevinsmithmd.com. And I don't want to offend him, but this is completely out of the box for classification, but it starts the discussion perfectly. So he says that he treats all types of migraine. This is a website. So obviously he's looking to propose his help to different people. I put in green the ones that um, well, first we remove the S for migraine. Now we say migraine as a disease, but so the green ones are the ones that are kind of in the classification. The yellow ones are the ones that it's kind of true what is there, but uh, it's, it's not in the classification. And the, the red ones are terms that are used by a lot of people, but are not diagnosis. Okay, so if we look, for example, at cluster migraines, Cluster migraine, this is not a diagnosis. Cluster migraine is something that is usually someone who has a cluster headache and a migraine or something that is sitting in between. Another thing like ocular migraine uh, is, is not a diagnosis. Silent migraine is not a diagnosis. Sleep migraine is not a diagnosis. Tension migraine is not a diagnosis. By definition, if you have tension headache or a migraine, or you can have different types of attacks, but not both, so it shows you a bit of daily migraine. What is that? It's not a diagnosis, it's just a description. Um, so hormonal migraine, 
well, that would be migraine influenced by hormones. So a lot of women live with that, um, but it's not a diagnosis either. But it describes things that do exist though. So we have to acknowledge that. So all along the centuries of, med of medical uh, knowledge, well, humans try to, uh, researchers try to uh, uh, classify migraine. And just to tell you in the 19th century, there was something we don't use anymore, but it was based on once again, vision. Well, there were red migraines and white migraines. So if you have the red migraine, your face is red. And if you have the white migraine, your face is white. And they thought that it was because the blood vessel dilate or they constrict, which makes some kind of sense. But nowadays, this is completely gone. We don't use this anymore. Um, then there are classifications by symptom. Okay, you can say migraine with aura, for example. And this is an official term. Vestibular migraine is migraine with dizziness and vertigo. We all think, I, I believe it exists, but is not, it is not yet an official diagnosis. Triggers, so you can say, okay, menstrual migraine is, the, is triggered by hormonal changes. And there's a lot of terms in the, the, uh, the population, like weather migraines, sinus migraines, neck migraines. Those are not official diagnoses, but they reflect the reality that some migraines are triggered by different things. And then frequency, episodic versus chronic, I'm going to talk about it. Or um, is this a spectrum maybe? So frequency is very important and it is getting more and more important as it influences how we deal sometimes with insurance companies. Okay. So my message here is that if you live with migraine um, and if the migraine diagnosis is made, it means that all the secondary stuff, you know, other diseases have been excluded. Well, the symptoms here, uh, the, your doctor usually will think a bit like this, okay? They will say, what are your symptoms, okay? Because migraine is very, very diverse. What are your triggers? Because then we can work on them. Absolutely, it makes sense to talk about the triggers, but it doesn't change the diagnosis. The health history, so you can have migraine with a bunch of other things in your body and mind and mental health and surgeries and accidents. We'll get back to the accidents. And then what did you try as for treatment trials? And sometimes this also influences how we think. So once you said that's migraine, it's migraine, well, that's, that's a bit of the work that the doctor will make. And it doesn't change the diagnosis, but it tells you how you should treat or orient you. Okay, so now we'll talk about aura, episodic chronic, refractory, and post-traumatic headache, which are a bit of the focus for tonight, past this explanation of how we diagnose, we diagnose uh, th stuff in medicine and how uh, migraine is uh, diagnosed. The aura. So the aura, remember what I said about vision. Uh, human beings love to see stuff. Vision is the very, very important sense, uh, perception. So aura has been described since antiquity. Even the old Greeks have described it. And um, here we have an early drawing of the typical evolution of the, or the visual aura. So it's something that people will see. Uh, it usually progresses over a few minutes. Sometimes people will have also symptoms like uh, sensation. So they may have tingling on one side of the body and the face that usually will move along the arm. It will march or progress. And, um, and uh, vision-wise, there's a lot of different symptoms that the aura can come with, right? So this is a, a study made in Brazil. And the participants in this study were asked to draw their auras. And as you can see, there were a lot of different drawings. So it can be colored, it can be flashes, it can be light, can be a lot of different things. But the characteristic of the aura is that it is usually progressive, it is not sudden, and it will last typically five to 30 minutes. And typically a person with an aura will have different, like many similar episodes over the years. The aura very often starts in childhood. It runs in families. Um, and when it is typical, it is usually as easy enough to diagnose. Here, it's an important point. People say very often the migraine aura. The correct way is migraine with aura or an aura, because you can have an aura with no migraine at all. This is a question I get almost every week. Someone comes and they're sent to me because they had a typical visual aura with squiggly lines or kaleidoscopes or colors, but they didn't have a headache. This is possible because the aura is a brain phenomenon 
and migraine is a different brain phenomenon. So what is happening inside the brain during an aura is not the same thing as what happens during a migraine, but those two things are linked. So the aura has a cause. It is caused, we think, almost certainly, by something we call cortical spreading depression. What that means is a wave of electric disturbance on the surface of the brain, the cortex, okay, so cortical, um, and where the wave goes, the symptoms happen. Because the wave moves along the brain from neuron to neuron, a bit like dominoes, or if you put a pebble in a pond, like the waves will just grow and grow. Well, uh, that's, that explains why the aura progresses slowly over time. And then eventually the wave resolves, the aura uh, stops, and then in certain people, migraine is triggered. So I encourage you, first to stop talking about ophthalmic migraine. Ophthalmic is the eye, and it's an old term for migraine with aura. Uh, so we, we really try to use the correct term, which is migraine with aura, not ophthalmic migraine anymore, and not migraine aura because of this difference. Even if those two things come together, like salt and pepper, but still salt is salt and pepper is pepper. So these are not auras. There's a lot of symptoms that actually um, sometimes people are not too sure what they are. Prodrome is a different thing. A prodrome is when you start a migraine attack and some people will have symptoms before they have the headache, craving for foods, neck pain, yawning, brain fog, irritability. It is sometimes a little vague. Some people have no prodrome at all. And for some people, it is very clear. So a prodrome is a different thing. We think that a prodrome comes from a different part of the brain than the aura. So it's important because then we, the aura comes from one place, the prodrome comes from another place. Some people have both, some people have neither, and they all have migraine. Photophobia is when the light hurts. So sometimes I ask if people have visual symptoms with the migraine, they will say, oh yeah, sure, the light hurts, uh, but that's not an aura. And then there's a ton of visual symptoms. I see black dots, white dots for a few seconds. I see colors when I close my eyes. I see blurry, I'm not too sure. And those are not considered aura, especially if they last for a few seconds or for many, many hours at a time. And they, they are not well defined. It's not always easy to, to put this diagnosis into words. And it takes a, a neurologist or someone who's very skilled with headache to kind of put things in the right boxes. And let me tell you, sometimes it's not that clear, okay? So that's one of the parts where some auras are super clear and some auras not too clear. It is important to distinguish migraine without aura, migraine with aura, um, but the, the hard truth is that a lot of people have both and they will have attacks with the aura and some attacks without the aura. Some people have only auras with no migraine and some people have auras that are caused by completely different stuff, like for example, stroke. So I told you about the wave of electricity. Well, this wave of electricity can be triggered by many things. And sometimes it is not related to migraine at all. Okay, so think of the aura as its own thing. It is a brain phenomenon with different characteristics. You may have heard the term complex auras. So those are auras that last a long time, may have speech symptoms, uh, the sensory symptoms, so tingling. People may paralyze, even lose completely their strength on one side. We call that hemiplegic migraine, confusion, basilar or brainstem, hallucinations even, very rare, uh, and Alice in Wonderland, which is seeing things bigger, smaller, like the Alice in the novel. And I will not go into great detail because all of those should be evaluated carefully by a neurologist, all right? Because usually GPs are not very comfortable with making a diagnosis of those symptoms. Silent migraine, okay. So, so this is getting very popular online. I see it a lot on social media. I see it on the forums, the patient forums. I even saw a post from uh, Migraine Again recently. I, adv I, ad I advise not to use this term and I'll say why. So, because it is not clear what it is, okay? So some people talk, use silent migraine to say it's a post, the postdrome, so there's no headache. The postdrome, there's no headache. Aura, without headache. 
So it's very confusing. What does it mean? Some people even have started to use the term silent migraine to describe any symptom that is unexplained otherwise, brain fog, dizziness. And then they say, well, maybe, you know, those symptoms are caused by all those mechanisms that cause migraine, but without the headache. To be honest, from a scientific perspective, it's possible. You know, why not? Those brain networks could cause a lot of symptoms. But remember that the research on migraine was done on people who have headache by definition, because it's, an, it's the way we defined it. So we cannot apply this research to people who do not have headaches. So I think if we want to study those people and people who have those symptoms, we should study them like they are. And I would seriously advise, because I've seen on social media sometimes people saying, oh, my doctor didn't know that silent migraine exists. Well, because it doesn't. It doesn't in the official classification. So if we want to start using this term, we have to seriously clarify what we are talking about. So I'm pretty strong about this. And I know some of you might be uh, uh, maybe surprised or even shocked, um, but I, I, I'm very, uh, that's why I'm giving this webinar. I care about words because words are the start for research and research is the key to better treatments. Now, chronic and episodic migraine. So we talked about the aura. Now we switch the gears. We talk about the uh, name of migraine. Let me tell you the story here. And it's a story that goes back maybe 20 years or 30 years ago. At the time, there was migraine with and without aura. It was the big thing. Nobody was talking about chronic migraine. But headache specialists, they knew, because they see in their office, that some people seem to have migraine almost every day with kind of attacks, little headaches, you know, different headache styles. And these people were difficult to treat. They were using a lot of medication to treat attacks. They sometimes had more health issues. And so uh, Dr. Lipton, a researcher, decided to call this transformed migraine. By transformed, he meant, well, this person had migraine attacks in the past, like once in a while, a few times per month. And then they were uh, uh, in, normal, in between the attacks, they were feeling okay, normal. And then they morphed, they transformed. So the migraine became more frequent, the headaches became more frequent, and it became something more difficult to treat. So that was a diagnosis that lasted for maybe a decade. And then, well, those patients, they were excluded from research studies on treatments because they were too sick. So usually pharmaceutical companies would say, nah, you know, they're not, we better exclude those guys because they're not going to get better with our treatments. So we'll focus on people who have well-defined attacks that we can count and in between they're okay. But then, interestingly, Botox occurred and Botox was studied in at first, right? It was seen in the cosmetic clinics that Botox helped with migraine. The studies were made on people, the episodic ones, the usual ones, but they did, it didn't work. Botox actually was not helpful. So then the, the, the eye of the company turned to the, this bunch of people who had very frequent attacks. And at the same time, the scientific community decided that maybe it was time to kind of define this, this group of people with severe migraine. And they called it chronic migraine. And they made a definition that is still uh, up to this day valid, which is 15 days per month of headache per, or more and eight days with migraine symptoms that fit the criteria for migraine. Just let me tell you this, a lot of GPs are not comfortable with this. So I'm telling you, like I'm talking to a fellow doctor, because if you live with migraine, you understand all of this. But this notion that in chronic migraine, there are different levels of headache is not always clear to uh, uh, certain physicians. And then from this definition of chronic migraine came the concept of chronification or progression, you know, before we had transformation. And then we started looking at who are these people who live with chronic migraine? What are the risk factors? What are their other diseases? And then what can we do to uh, prevent chronification? So this was something that occurred over the past 20 years. But now we know that it's not cookie cutter like this. It's not that clear. Migraine is a spectrum and some people will have months 20 days per month. Some people will have months, eight days. 
over their lifetime, a person with migraine will have different frequency. And this is a bit what we call a roller coaster of migraine. So you see here the frequency from zero to 30 over months. And you see people vary a lot. Some people don't vary. Some people, all their lives, they will have four, attack, four migraine attacks per month, maybe around their period, and that's going to be it. But some people chronify or transform or deteriorate over time. So maybe we should actually be more clear that episodic and chronic is not the best way. Maybe we should look at the frequency to be more precise. Is, is, what is the frequency per month? So at present time, this is not official at all. This is a concept that is discussed by doctors, but that maybe we should just drop this episodic and chronic business and just say you have migraine two to four days per month, eight days per month, 20 days per month, 30 days per month. And so we are more precise. Because that's the story usually, you know, when, when chronification does happen and when, why should we wait for that to happen? Why can't we just treat people before they get chronic, before they are in this bad migraine state? How can we do that? I think that's still a very, very important question. And this illustrates a little bit the life of a person with migraine, starting with, you know, sometimes in childhood, puberty, hormonal changes, especially for women, but also stressors accidents, you know, life happens to you, as we say, and then a lot of other things can happen, you can fall into medication overuse, and then path your 40, 50, and you have chronic migraine. I want to just say one thing is that the term chronic is not good, because chronic in Canada, there's a list of chronic diseases. Chronic diseases are diseases that last for the lifetime of a person, okay? And they, they come with a lot of programs, funding, research, statistics. At present time, migraine is not listed as a chronic disease. And it's a, partly because of our own fault, because we decided to name chronic only for the people who have this famous 15 days plus, which is, as I've shown you, not really good because it's a continuum. It's not like a cookie cutter approach. So... I think at the end of the day, we should start, but what that's not, that's the future, I believe. We should have all migraine listed as a chronic disease and then talk about the exact frequency of a person. But as to this day, insurance companies, classification, we're still with episodic and chronic. I just wanted to share with you the limitations of this way of uh, categorizing. And then there's another word you will say, refractory. Refractory it means that it's difficult to treat. This is the definition of the, the dictionary. But how do we define that? You know, is it a number of treatments tried? How many? Are you refractory if you tried one preventive, two preventive, four preventive? I have patients, they have tried 15 preventives. What if you started with an antibody right away versus trying other meds? What if your treatment is Botox? And then you have to try five treatments before. So I'm not too sure about, about this definition of refractory. Um, refractory, can, would that mean maybe that you don't respond to an antibody, a CGRP antibody? So the refractory term is not still completely officially defined. And I think it will evolve over time. Uh, I will skip over this one. Just to say that chronic migraine, rare as defined, severe migraine, rarely comes alone. And a lot of people actually have other conditions playing a role in their disease. Um, so here you have a little graph showing all uh, some diseases on the left. If you look on the top, you will see insomnia, depression, anxiety. So they very often come with uh, chronic migraine. Um, and then you have other things uh, so with migraine in general, sorry. So allergies, arthritis, vitamin D deficiency, uh, osteoarthritis, hypertension. So all of these other diseases come with migraine. And this is another table, and I'll, I'll just look at the colors. Don't try to look at the numbers here. The point here is that if you live with chronic migraine, especially refractory and difficult to treat, and for years, there's usually not only migraine. Some people have no other issues. The one on the, the right side of the graph, well, it's all almost all green. So these people have no other problems. On the left side of the graph, these people have a lot of other problems from different categories. So in my practice, I often see chronic migraine patients. 
and they will have problems with the blood vessels, with the lungs, with their GI system, their gastrointestinal. They will have mental health issues. They will have other pains. They will have other brain diseases. So you cannot at this stage just talk about migraine. You have to also look at the rest of the, 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 the condition. Because chronic migraine, when it transforms, we think that's what happened, um, is that something, the person usually will start with occasional migraine, not always, but usually. And then something or many things happen. And then it starts vicious circles, um, sleep issues, stress and anxiety, muscle tension, jaw tension. And then the person starts to lose its ground, right? Life is becoming more and more stressful. You start avoiding more and more things. There's tension at work. And then you start drinking more coffee. You cannot exercise. You take more and more pills, more and more analgesics. And all of this just circles and circles around until uh, the situation is worse and worse. So treatment of migraine and chronic migraine is important because we want to revert all of this back to normal. So this part was the one about episodic and chronic migraine, refractory migraine. Why are some people struggling? This is a slide for doctors, but I wanted to show you and it actually just explains a few things. Well, it can be maybe there's different types of chemicals involved. Maybe there's a mental health issue, medical issues, maybe neck issues. There's a lot of stuff. And just to tell you that the research is going on. Now, last part of our discussion tonight is post-traumatic headache. So, okay, you had an accident, you had a brain or a, a, head, a head or neck injury, what we call sometimes a traumatic brain injury, TBI or concussion. Concussion, by the way, is not something that is very well defined. It's a very common term, but even in conferences to this day, I ask the question all the time and say, what's the difference between a mild traumatic brain injury or MTBI and concussion? <laughs> it's not that clear. Okay, so you have a headache now. What is your diagnosis? This little graph here puts all the scenarios that can happen in a person who had a concussion or many. Well, this person can maybe have no headache before ever, right? So then this person has post-traumatic headache. And then will it persist over a long time? Let's say it does. But what if this person had migraine before? What if this person had chronic migraine before? What if this person had tension type headache before, but now has neck pain plus migraine symptoms? So it's, it is, there are many different, different scenarios. And sometimes the best is once again, to really look at the different parts and put them together. Because usually when a trauma occurs, it's a little bit like the graph I showed you about the vicious circles. There's an accident. There might be some lesions, right? And I showed you about, talked talk to you about the nerves. There might be some lesions. There might be some crushed bone, crushed nerves, crushed or, or, or stretched neck or whatever, something that happens in the flesh, right? And that causes symptoms that might heal very well. Or there might be also some trauma to the brain that we cannot see. Uh, so that's very difficult. You know, how do we look at this in concussion? And then there is all the stress from the trauma and the, ch the changes in someone's lives, right? There can be a lot of litigation with insurance company. There can be impact on your work, impact on, on, on the relationships with others. And then all of this can cycle to a very, very difficult situation. And I see a lot of people who struggle with post-traumatic headache over months and sometimes many years. The worst case, well, the worst case, a difficult scenario is, or what I call the perfect storm, is when someone who has migraine, who was born or who developed migraine at a young age, so has a bit of, you know, biological genetic migraine, migraine is brain, all I've showed you before with all the mechanisms. And then this person has maybe one first trauma, maybe a whiplash, maybe another and maybe another, or maybe just one big one, who cares, a story of accidents, and then it builds up and builds up and builds up, and then move this person to a state of chronic migraine or chronic post-traumatic headache. And then all of this gets, get mixed up. It becomes uh, difficult with insurance company because they will say, oh, you had migraine before, so the trauma has nothing to do with it. 
And remember that insurance companies usually will do what they can to say that you know they don't have to pay. So it's not, it's not the uh, they will uh, deny that the trauma was the initial cause for the problem, and they have interest in doing this. On the other side, well, sometimes the trauma is the problem, but there's also sometimes other factors. It can be, for example, the worst thing is when a person with migraine has a trauma during a very stressful period. So the brain during a stressful period is sensitive, more sensitive, and sometimes this will cause symptoms to persist over time. That's what I see in my practice. There's no special name for that, but this is what I call the perfect storm. But this, from a diagnostic perspective, is complicated. Okay, so look at the pretty horses here and look at the zebra. Zebra is different, but kind of looks like the horses, right? So if you come in my office and you had a story of migraine and then you had a whiplash and then a trauma and then now you have a chronic headache with other symptoms, I will probably diagnose you with migraine and post-traumatic headache because it's not true that if you never had migraine before, it's the same story that if you did. Um, so we have to start making a difference between post-traumatic headache and migraine. I see this because on the forums, I follow them, uh, a lot of people will talk about their migraine and it's okay. They will say my migraine or the migraine or they treat migraine, um, but I never had headaches before my accident. So people who never had be headaches before their accidents and then develop severe lasting persistent headaches, we should call, we should diagnose post-traumatic headache um, because these people are different from people with migraine before. Uh, they have different imaging, they have different symptoms, they have different prognosis, usually it's more difficult to treat, and they have different responses to antibodies. CGRP antibodies do not work very well for people who have post-traumatic headache with no migraine. So I think uh, it's okay, we do what we can, we use the migraine treatments for people with post-traumatic headache, but we have to be clear about what the story is and what happened really, and what was the state before the trauma and after the trauma, and clarify stuff. If you look at the X-Men story, you will probably uh, recognize this little blue lady here. Uh, I hear that Jennifer Lawrence spent a lot of time in makeup for this movie, so the result is pretty striking. But if you know this lady here, but well, you know that she can change shape as she wishes. Uh, mystic, I think she's mystique, I think she's called. So post-traumatic headache has different faces. It can look like pretty much anything. I've seen people with trauma, they look like cluster headache. I saw one today. I, I see some patients, they have tension headache. They have no migraine symptoms. The majority though will have a headache, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to effort, sensitivity to sound, some, some tinnitus, you know, some sounds in their ears. Some of them even will have uh, electric shocks, in different places, and lots of them will have neck pain, especially if they had whiplash. So how do you diagnose that? You know, do you put all of this in the same mixed buffet, or do you just call it post-traumatic headache, but then there's a lot of different symptoms to treat here and different pieces to address? So I think the best here is really to stick to classification, but a knowledge that post-traumatic headache can look like a lot of different things, and depending on what it looks like, we usually what we teach to uh, doctors is that, well, if a post-traumatic headache looks like migraine, you treat like migraine. And that's, I show this little kid's game then to say, well, you put you know, the right shape in the right hole and you try to kind of do your best with what you have. All right. So my conclusion before I take a few questions is, um, well, when we, we see a person who consults for a headache, what should we do? And maybe my suggestion, and actually it's a suggestion from a colleague from Montreal, Dr. Manu, is we should use a multi-actual classification of migraine uh, and, and of headache actually altogether. Because just using a big red stamp and say migraine or not migraine, you know, or post-traumatic headache or no post-traumatic headache, it's a good start, but it's not enough. So what I usually teach my residents is you have to first list the, the diagnoses that are accurate according to the classification as much as possible. 
uh, or at least a little bit, you know, you have a, some idea of what you're talking about. So you, you start with that. And then you describe who the person is. What are the medical issues of this person? What are the mental health issues of this person? What are the social factors of this person? And what is the impact of the headache condition on this person? And based on that, then we can build a good therapeutic plan. So if this person has migraine, neck pain, fibromyalgia, let's say, sleep apnea, hypertension, and uh, medication overuse, then you code all of this and then you adapt your treatment plan. And sometimes, as I said at the beginning, it's not that clear. Sometimes I sometimes take one or two or three visits before I have a clear idea of what is going on. So in conclusion, uh, Dr. Smith um, was completely wrong on many things, but he's showing the reality of what we hear in real life. And I hope that I have showed you and explained to you that terms matter, that words matter, and but sometimes there are realities in the headache world that generate those terms that are maybe not diagnoses, but still we should mention if they are triggers, if they are symptoms, if they are comorbidities, but just keep things clear about what we are talking about. So sometimes there are too many diagnoses. Sometimes the diagnosis is not clear. And description of symptoms is best until we know what's going on. And treatments can always be tried anyway, right? We don't have official tests. So sometimes we try an error. It's, uh, it's the usual way. Um, but let's try to clarify the diagnosis as best as, best as we can. So I will finish now on uh, uh, welcoming you to our Move for Mi Migrant Canada campaign. You can donate to us. You can check our different teams. You can create your own team and uh, join us and support us. And uh, I have my uh, bracelet here. I wear it proudly and I, uh, uh, I'm always glad to talk about migraine. Thank you. 